and then can I have the link as soon as you have it? Yep. Okay. I don't know the link. Um, oh, fuck. Yeah, I don't know what the public link is. Okay, let me go see what I... Let me log in from my side and see yeah. what I can find out. Can someone post the link of where the live stream is coming out? None, none of them are there, right? Okay, I got it. Do you? Yep. Okay, all right. It's the one in the K. Okay, all right. You got it? Yeah. Okay. Kill that. Nobody's going to find this now. I'm tweeting. Ah, don't worry about it. this all right so I still <laughs> I still need to figure this out oh we were so close we were so very very <laughs> close <laughs> Patrick got the notification, then heard you swear. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I swear. <laughs> Which is awesome. Can folks hear me other than the swear that came out of my mouth? <laughs> yeah, people can hear both of us. Okay. Uh, Larry Beckham says he can't hear both of us, but other people can. Fraser, you look really short next to me. Can you adjust your camera? Well, you're tall. Um, let's adjust your camera. You look great in Zoom. You're so much taller than me. Here, let's make you bigger. There. Hello, everyone. Okay, and then I'll kill this. Which is sort of what Pamela was hearing before the, the show. was like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going <laughs> to change the setting. I'm going to fix this. So we were close. We were close. I'll just, I, I've just got to mess with these settings. For some reason, it wasn't pulling the audio from Pamela's device. And I didn't feel like troubleshooting. So we went back to the old way. Not like it's that much different. This is fine. It Pamela. is absolutely fine. Yeah. Yes. No, I'm not no hair. I'm, uh, I'm wife has been in Costa Rica for a week and a half, um, hair. So no, we haven't recorded any new shows. She gets back on Tuesday. So, and then I go to, to, uh, Iceland. So, okay. <laughs> Are things better now? Mm-hmm. All right, let's uh, say hi to some people. Hello to Arnold Post, Ben Appleby, Ben Kalo, Carolyn B, Coalfire, Concerned Rabbit, Dusty Reichwin, Elit Avron, Eric Knapp, Eric N. Bennett, Graham Walbridge, Her Harry M., Elg Bjorkog, Hugo Burnham, Jamie Berg, Janelle Duncan, John Seffield, Johnny Zed, Joseph Myers, Quad Libet, Lee Stevens, Nancy Graziano, Nicola Williams, Noel Ruppenthal, Patrick Festa, Paul Gracie, Pontouche, Richard, R V B V Akama, Arvakama, Susie Murph, Tak Tang, The Pumpkin Moon, Thomas Traniker, Tom Van Scotter, Tor H, Tyler Page Howell, Uncle Bill Druin, William Vandebeek, Eunice Free, and Zapfin Zapfin. Hey everybody. So what do you think about the humanity sphere? Huh? Okay, so you know Oh, the the disco ball. Yeah. Okay. I mostly I'm really, really amused because like it's great for ham radios and things like that. And yes, it creates streaks across your astronomical images. But there's already so much stuff up there. Why are you making fun of the one satellite that happens to like also be good for ham radio operators? 
Noel Ruppenthal wants me to shift you a little to the right. Okay, Noel, this is for you, buddy. How's that? Say when. Say when we're when we're there. Are we there? And you're a little loud, which yeah. No, no, no. You mic no, keep that mic close. It's just that my microphone Oh, I see. Yeah, okay. I can No, I've already got you turned down, but I will further what <laughs> uh, <laughs> dr he is always allowed to deal with it all right here let, let, i'm gonna turn you down just a little bit all right yeah so the astronomers are a little angry so with the humanity sphere, this is of course this as you said the disco ball that was that was launched by uh rocket lab as part of their electron rocket they um they had uh, put this ball up there, and now astronomers are a little mad that it's going to pass through their field of view from time to time. And actually, um, Alex, oh, I forget his last name. Parker. Parker, yeah, 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 had just posted a photo that he had taken using Hubble where a satellite went right through his field of view in the middle of his data, right? Which is crushing when you're using Hubble. And to think of the field of view that he has access to and the fact that a that a a satellite went through that tiny little piece, that tiny little field of view at the moment that he was using Hubble, right? He said that, you know, it's like one billionth or whatever it was of the night sky and it happened to go through his field of view. And so he loses the data behind it. Yep. Yeah, it happens to all of us, just not all of us with Hubble. And that's where the particularly crushing part comes in is is which instrument he had that blight occur with. Yeah, no one wants you even more composed. To th he, wa he wants me to follow the rule of thirds here. OK, all right. <laughs> Let's get on to this thing we like to do, which we call astronomy cast. I believe that's our job, right? I think. I think so. Okay. I think so. All right. Well, if you have no idea what kind of a dumpster fire you've stumbled into, <laughs> we are going to do a live episode of Astronomy Cast. And then when we do that, we're going to stick around and answer your questions about space and astronomy. I'm going to press record in a second. I, I can do that. You ready? Yep. I'm pressing record. It's recording. Hello, Hi. Chad. Hello, Chad. All right. I'm also pressing record. Here we go. Astronomy Cast, episode 476, the overview effect. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts-based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today. With me, as always, Dr. Pamela Gay, the director of technology and citizen science at the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Fraser? Doing very well. Just, man, like two weeks from now, I will be in Iceland chasing auroras with Paul Sutter. And it's going to be awesome. I, I am very envious. I will be shortly after you get back. I'm going to be going to Amsterdam for the European Testing Conference. Yep. Then I'm coming home for a couple of weeks, and then I will be going to Japan for the Communicating Astronomy to the public conference. Um, but that's nowhere as near as Iceland, which is on my bucket list. Yeah, totally for, on my bucket list. Yeah. You know, this I'm going to hit two of my bucket lists this year, I hope. So the bucket list that I'm going to go for is Iceland, and then this summer I'm going to Australia and I will finally get a chance to see the the Southern Hemisphere constellations and and the largest small Magellanic cloud and the Omega cluster and like it's just it's so great down there and I can't wait to be able to see that. So. Where are you going to dark skies? Don't know. We're going to be in Byron Bay. There's an astronomy conference and they're having me be the keynote speaker. So I'll be cool. doing that. Yeah. All right, uh, but let's get on with this episode. So after they've been to space, many astronauts report that seeing the world from above has given them a totally new perspective on humanity and the state of our planet. It's called the overview effect. And today we'll talk about this and what this perspective can teach us all. 
And I just want to say in advance that this is a complete. This is going to sound like a total woo woo, overly spiritual um, conversation. And I'm going to make sure it doesn't. That is well, my and, and job. So well, for sure. Okay. Um, but but also that. <laughs> that I think there's some really valuable lessons here and I think it's re it is really important what what these astronauts have gone through and they have a lot to teach us. So so I think we will get into a bit of a you know mind bending semi spiritual moment and I'm okay for one episode for us to get a little little out there. So let's do it. Overview effect. What is it? How, how did this concept first come about? I, it was actually given its name in 1987 by Frank White, but it was something that had previously been no, noticed uh, really as something novel for the first time in the Apollo missions. Back in 1968, when we had the first spacecraft that made it all the way to the moon, and we're looking back and seeing Earth in complete isolation in space, it caused the astronauts to have this moment of, holy whatever you find holy the earth is all by itself in space and appears so fragile and alone and and this is that one time you realize that all of humanity is really trapped on the outside of a sphere orbiting in isolation and 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 you know did it become a conversation i guess that other people then sort of, uh, you know, chimed in as well. It, it's something that came up across multiple nations. It came across uh, lots of different uh, projects. And it's actually become something that psychologists have been doing research on and trying to find ways to replicate the change in motivation and change in behavior that seems to have paralleled the experience of seeing the Earth from such a high vantage point. And so what was the what was this sort of change in in motivation and behavior from from the astronauts? Well, previously and and the context that they look at this within is astronauts are people who are by and large trained with a great deal of science and engineering to go through checklists to do this, to do that, to stay alive using science. Right. And in general, when you see people who are speaking about awe, about fragility, about um, humanity in um, very religious kinds of language, you don't tie it to the same kinds of people that we generally send out of space. You instead expect to see this kind of language coming from theologians, from yogis, from people who seek transcendental states as part of how they experience the world. And for reasons that psychologists are working to understand, the same kind of emotional trans transcendency that can be achieved in some meditative states is also achieved almost consistently with astronauts, uh, less consistently with high altitude pilots. And there seems to be something about being utterly disconnected from nice, safe, able to live without thought and being in a situation where you realize the only safe place to live is not where I am. Yeah. And people don't realize how special that is at a very subconscious layer. All this goes through and it changes how people relate to humanity. But I wonder, so, so I think you sort of touched up a bit of it, right? Is it, is it about the fact that you are in in when you're an astronaut you are in in an incredibly precarious situation that you are depending on every single piece of hardware that surrounds you to keep you alive the oxygen the water the the co2 scrubbers the hull you know the the hull itself 
and then of course the uh, the capabilities of both the ground and your astronaut crewmates to keep you alive and to keep each other alive and that it is very much like you're in a life raft and there is a big ocean liner right over there and if you do everything right then you'll be able to make it to you know to safety otherwise you're going to die in just a million different ways it, but it's it, but but it doesn't like it doesn't feel and I kind of have I've had sort of senses of that you know when you're flying in an airplane and you're having really awful turbulence you know what I mean like it's just terrible so, turbulence <laughs> and you're just like so, there will be a time when I'm on the ground and you look out the window you're like that's the ground and someday very soon I will be down there and everything will be better so so luckily the astronauts tend to not have this when they most think they're going to die like you they they tend to most have this when their view is isolated right so it's something that occurs at a subconscious level uh due to the physical vantage point uh ron garen in 19 uh, sorry in 2008 did this amazing tethered uh arc off of the robot robotic arm and he talks about this as when and i'm going to quote him i was hit in the gut with an undeniable sobering contradiction he's he's talking about the effect of seeing a stunning fragile oasis this island that has been given to us and has protected all of life from the harshness of space. So it's in seeing this contradiction between earth, vibrant and alive and space, death, surrounding that fragile bubble yeah. that, that this feeling is brought about. And in, in psychology, when people are trying to understand this, it is seen as a cognitive shift that takes place where people change just their entire perspective on how they look at life here on earth. Yeah. And, you know, we've talked about this a bit in, you know, we've talked about the, um, you know, how viable the universe is for life. And we always say that the universe is trying to kill you. And when you consider the state of the entire universe, you know, 13, well, 46 billion light years in all directions just for the observable universe. Who knows how much bigger the actual universe is when you consider the solar system, every place in this entire universe, even potentially other habitable worlds in the habitable zone, they are not Earth. There is there. Earth is the best place in the entire universe for life on Earth. And so you know, and it's not just the whole earth. It's this, as you say, it's this thin skin. It's this tiny little atmospheric section that in this slice of time that we live in today is the, is the only time and place that this is going to be the best place in the universe for life on earth. And where this becomes particularly fascinating for psychologists is can you cause people who haven't been to outer space to experience this moment of shifted perspectives? And this is where Frank White comes in in a lot of ways because he experienced this as an airplane pilot flying high above the planet and looking down and realizing against the vastness of just the horizon how fragile the earth is and there are researchers trying to figure out can we put people into vr simulations mm. can we put people into situations where they have this ron garen flying over the space station looking down and seeing the fragility of all of it moment because we're never going to be able to send everyone to space but when you look at how the astronauts have gone on to cherish things in a very different way, you have to wonder, can we spread that change in perspective? 
And in some ways, there's always been something like this where explorers coming back from the wilderness have a very different view on the lack of birds in the city. When people who've only ever experienced one small part of culture, if you had only ever been to Vancouver, if I had only ever been to Boston, we would be completely different people who had a much more limited perspective on culture, on life, on even just geography of mm -hmm. landscape. If you and I can be changed by the fact that we've gotten to travel around the world, well, we've only adhered to the top 40,000 feet of it. <laughs> right. What if we could get 65 miles up, 300 miles up on a regular basis through VR and experience that as our perspective on how we make our decisions? But I wonder if you can sort of induce, if you can force that, that effect. Like when you're flying over, I remember as a little kid, my parents took me to Mexico and we flew into Mexico City and I must have been four or five years old. And the, I guess the path that the airplane took was right over the city for a big chunk of it. And so I could look down and see these big tall buildings, but then also see cars driving around and even people walking around. And I got this really bizarre perspective. And it's funny because I, it felt to me like it was such a normal thing that you always experience. But I actually have, you know, for the amount of that I've flown since then, never have experienced sort of seeing humanity from that perspective since. I think it possibly was just the, the pathway that the airplane took as it went over the city and I got to see it in my little, you know, childhood brain. But it was very profound and have sort of, it's one of my sort of anchor memories of my, of my adulthood. But the, the, the Dallas to Los Angeles approach going into land at LAX, you get that almost every time, depending on weather. Yeah. Um, but weather in LA is fairly consistent. And it is profound to be able to look down and see a kid's soccer game going on in the school to be able to tell it's recess time or everyone's stuck in traffic on the commute. And there's that motorcycle racing between lanes. It's it is different. Now, what, uh, what, you know, we've talked about a bit about the impact and they've gone on to sort of dedicate their life to, you know, the astronauts after they're done astronauting, they have many have dedicated themselves to, to the planet to some yes. of these causes, right? And and so we see many of the astronauts go on to become advocates for the environment advocates for protecting climate, atmosphere, water. We see them go on to participate in arts where, where several of them have found ways to try and communicate what it was that they experienced through painting, through, we, we have uh, Chris Hadfield with all of his photography. There's now the Overview Institute that has been formed and they're trying to capture the spirit spirit of this however they can there was a movie released several years ago it's completely free and available on vimeo that's about the overview effect and and their goal is to go from having just a movie that tells the story of this to their putting money into how do you develop the VR experience? Is it enough to just stick the goggles on and put someone in a chair? Do you need to put them into some sort of a neutral buoyancy container so that they can have more of a mm. sense sensory experience as well? What is required yeah. to trigger the cognitive shift? Yeah. And this is fascinating where it starts to become a science question to change our emotional response. Uh, one of the things that people always seem ask me is like, why should we go to space when there's all of these problems here on Earth that need to be fixed? And I'm sure you've heard m that question many times. And my answer used to be like, we need to go to space because we need to make humanity a multi-planet species and that was that's very much the elon musk perspective and and actually my perspective on this has totally changed in the last i would say two years or so and it's jeff bezos 
richest man on earth who was in a conference and someone was like asked like why go to, you know why go to space when there's so many problems here on earth and he said he the gist was that he recognizes that earth is is as i said the best place in the universe for life on earth it is earth has does one thing better than anything else you can find in the entire universe and that is to be a place that has life on it that has an ecosystem that has the atmosphere surrounding it and the water cycle and the temperature and the amount of oxygen and carbon dioxide and nitrogen and all these things right and that and that we pollute it with our heavy industry with our with our vehicles with all of these things and in his perspective the best reason to go to space is to get that stuff off of the planet to set up the the asteroid mining and the solar powered beaming back down to earth to take all of the things that take away from the planet that planet's number one job right the only place in the universe that can do this one thing let's let the earth focus on that and let's take if we can get everything else off of this planet and i and i feel like that perspective you know that as we start to you know you see what's happening with the people in cape town where they're starting to run out of water and you see these issues that as we push the environment to the to the limits you know and again we we've mentioned this in the past right protect the earth earth's fine earth doesn't need us earth earth isn't is in no way concerned about about how we're going to be what matters is we want to protect the earth for us and that's and, the perspective. And going to space gives us the ability to study ourselves in a way that can't be done as effectively any other way. Uh, just last night, I was looking at some satellite imagery of Algeria, where there is amazing uh imagery of an old Roman city where you look down and you see lush vegetation interrupted by a perfect grid of old stone walls with a triumphal arch in the center of it. And it gives you this realization that these disparate places on our planet are all connected through ancient architecture of all things, that humanity has always been out there warring and finding peace has always been out there cross crossing our cultures crossing our ideas and changing how each of our cultures is able to live and evolve and from space you start to realize that we all have our own traditions, but we're all still one people on one planet. And it's important to see both the sameness and the other. And all of this somehow comes into focus at once when you're looking down at these diverse geographies that are still somehow all on one planet. Yeah, and, and, and every astronaut that I've ever talked to, when they look down on the Earth as they're orbiting around the planet, the thing that they always notice is how they don't notice the differences between the countries. They don't notice the difference between the political regions. Uh, you know, you can't really see when you've moved from Canada to the United States or when you, you know, you may recognize specific features like the city of New York or, or things like that, especially at night, but you can't. But what you do notice is these times when you cross over regions that are um that have some kind of environmental problem like if you yeah. go over um uh was ha I think haiti for example like half of that island is completely deforested and then the other half of the island is and it's two different nations that had two different the dominican republic yeah the dominican republic they had two different approaches to handling the resources of their of their countries and you can see that from space and so and things like you can't even, you know, the, of course, it's a big myth. You can't see the, the Great Wall of China from space. But you can see the demilitarized zone in Korea. And that's one of the great sadnesses that many of the astronauts talk about is looking down on the Korean peninsula and seeing this brightly lit South Korean nation with all of its technology 
literally shining its lights up into space. And then there's this concentration along the border. And then there's nothing. There's a bit of a dot for Pyongyang and there's bits and pieces, but nothing, nothing substantial like you see scattered in other rural parts of the world. And these sadnesses become even more poignant when you can see with your own eyes the difference between the haves and the have-nots from 300 miles away. I think the one of the most, you know, the, the best crack that anyone has done to try and give as many of us as possible this the feeling of the overview effect was the pale blue dot image. Yes. And this is, you know, this was this photograph that was taken by the Voyager spacecraft, required some convincing by Sagan and, um, and others to convince them to turn the spacecraft back and take pictures of all of the planets, not for really science purposes, but to help us see our perspective in the, in the universe. And what I love about this story is that they had the, when they got the pale blue, when they got the image of the earth, they couldn't find the earth in the image. And they're like, oh, well, I guess it's just, it's too small. We don't have the resolution. And then, and then they're like, wait a minute. Nope, there it is. And, and in this one streak of sunlight, this one piece of like optical interference in the camera system because the earth was too close to the sun for it to be a really great picture was the earth. And so the entire planet could hide in this little sunbeam that was, was being seen by the Voyager spacecraft. And, and you realize that, that that's it. That's all of us right there, the whole planet, everybody, uh, and as Carl Sagan, right, everybody who's ever lived, everybody who's ever died, all of your friends, all of your family, they're in that one little, pale blue dot hidden inside that sunbeam and it, this is this is something that every time we look back at earth it's always the same wow moment where when we look back with osiris rex to see the earth and the moon so far apart in such a black field and and we need to try and understand why it is we feel this way that's a cool scientific question and then we need to figure out how to share the perspective because maybe that will get more people thinking about how all the pieces fit together and yeah I like and this. that's the cool part our, our zone is saying in the in the chat um i remember an astronaut saying he was able to cover the earth with his thumb when he was on the moon and and so you know when you go outside you can cover the entire moon we've talked about this many times with your pinky fingernail and from the moon the earth is about 13 times bigger than than the moon is from the earth and so you it, it's perfectly covered you by your thumb held and, a little closer to your face a little bit yeah but i think you know at it roughly you know just bef closer to arm's length you could blot out the entire planet with with one hand which is again just just amazing so so what can people do to you know maybe share the overview effect or attempt to kind of recreate it apart from going to space which i mean if that's what we've got to do i think that's just the sacrifice yes, we're all going to have to make exactly is we're all going to have to take these trips out to space but assuming we can't do that how can we gain some of that perspective well, it, for starts, go watch the overview film on Vimeo. Like I said, it's completely free. It's put out by the Planetary C Collective. And it takes into consideration these, these different ideas. Celebrate the blue marble image that NASA updates on a fairly regular basis that looks at our planet in its entirety, both during the day and then often at night as well. That one I don't think is updated quite as frequently. And get other people looking at the world as a whole in space imagery. Stop using just your Google Maps 
and start using actual space photos. Don't just look at astronomy picture of the day. Also go look at what's coming down with the aqua and discover spacecraft. See these pictures of the earth. Go try out image detective on CosmoQuest right. and explore all the astronaut images and see just how beautiful and how broken our planet is and We've all seen, hopefully, that picture of the one last black rhino being protected by a soldier. A picture tells a story that it sometimes takes too many words to get a person to hear. Find that picture that changes you and then change others with that picture. Awesome. There, see, told you we were going to go off the deep end today, but that was that was great. We'll see you next week, Pamela. See you. Okay, I have stopped and now I shall save. Me too. Um, 476. Yep. There it is. And I'm remembering to pause Dropbox before I do it. And cut. <laughs> Someone said that. Ben Appleby said that. It's true. Well, thank you all for sticking around with all the chaos we had <laughs> trying to get this episode started. Uh, life did not go the way one might wish for. Nobody noticed, or maybe lots of people noticed, but nobody noticed that I hadn't changed the from the weekly space hangout to the astronomy cast. And this is one of the reasons why we're doing this is I want a completely separate set of scenes so I could just change it to be in weekly space hangout mode or change it to be in astronomy cast mode. But we'll get there. We'll get there. Man, I yep. love having that conversation with, with astronauts. And it's so it's pretty funny to me how they tend to have the same that same perspective. It's like you yeah. know, one of us, one of us like they they go to space and they come back and they you know, it's like a trope in science fiction, right? They come back different. Like yeah. They just they just come back with a with a literally different perspective. With a different perspective about the planet. Yeah. Uh, so go ahead, ask us any questions. There's been tons and tons of crazy space news happening. The Falcon, you want to talk about the Falcon Heavy? Yeah. So it finally has a launch date as a earliest possible date. They still have to get a Falcon Nine off the pad ahead of it. What was the um, What was the earliest date? Uh, I think they said February eighth or ninth. It was it was announced earlier today. The ninth. Okay, I'll be in Iceland, um, but that's awesome. Of course, it's not going to be the ninth, but obviously, right? Uh, Matthew Lear says Fraser Black Holes started listening eight years ago to the podcast. Where are we now for Black Holes? W Stay tuned, Matthew. Yeah. Uh, in we're going to get a photograph, a photograph of by which he means a digital image a digital image of <laughs> the event horizon of the supermassive black hole at the heart of the milky way within the next couple of months which is going to yeah. be pretty neat of course it's going to be you know it's going to be a little blob right it's going to be super disappointing but we'll do a whole show probably about it when that when that happens so people can interpret the blob but it's going to be amazing to know that we're actually seeing the event horizon of a supermassive black hole. What, what would you say is new in the black hole world? I, the fact that there's these weird intermediate mass ones that we're detecting with uh, gravitational waves that people are theorizing may be primordial black holes is pretty new and pretty cool. Um. And we broke Fraser. Well, Nancy's posting a link. Sorry, Nancy's posting a link in the chat. What are you posting a link about? The oh, picture's not out, is it? No, no, no. I Well, so she's been posting a lot of links. Um, one of the things that she's going to remind me I need to announce is we're doing a survey of what it is do you guys want to learn, know, and do with podcasts. Right. So check out the link that has been added uh, to, I think, all the chats by Susie and Nancy and fill out our surveys. We also have surveys for anyone who's done citizen science. Um, and this will help us with some research studies that we're working on. Ben Appleby is saying, will Skylon be revolutionary? 
Okay, so you probably don't even know what Skyline is. I'm, no. Skyline. So Skyline is a is a British uh, uh, single stage to orbit s- spacecraft, and the thing that's cool about Skylon is that it will have an an air breathing engine at lower altitudes and then it will kick over to a rocket engine at higher altitudes and then carry it off into space the problem is is that right now skylon is nothing more than a mostly tested engine it's not all the other parts yet and the funding has really dried up on the skylon and even if they get the skylon work so in theory it should be a single stage to orbit It'll, it'll load it up with cargo it'll fly to up to space, deliver its cargo, fly back, land, refuel. Like, it'll be like an airplane, but it'll go to space. And it's a wonderful idea. The problem is that that staged rockets are still a much better, more fuel-efficient way than attempting to pull off a single stage to orbit. So there are rockets. Uh, I forget which one it is. The Atlas rockets, I believe, could be single stage if they carried no payload so you could just like take an atlas rocket you could fill it up with fuel it could fly to space and and deliver a payload in in one single stage but the amount of payload it could deliver is a fraction of what you could deliver with a with a staged rocket so even if you get to perfect single stagery when you compare that to say the the spacex bfr where you've got two stages that are initially stacked, they get up, they detach, both halves land again, you've got a, an enormous amount of payload that you can carry because you're kicking off one of those those stages. So stage rocketry is always going to be more efficient. In the past, nobody had reusable staged rocketry, so it just seemed ridiculous. But now with SpaceX and now with what's happening with Blue Origin and now what's happening with with even the Russians are getting in on this, and now United Launch Alliance is getting on with this. This is going to be, I think this is going to be the future. And so the Skylon, I think to be able to have rocket engines that work in the air and then work to work in space is, is going to be the, I think that'll be the next development, right? Which is to be able to have some kind of way to minimize the amount of oxidizer that you're going to need while your rocket is 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 within the atmosphere and can pull in oxygen anyway. That is the, I think that's what Skylon has to teach us is how to, how to do that. And so if you can get to this world where you've got two stage, like the BFR, but that first stage, the sea level stage pulls in oxygen from the atmosphere, then that is the most efficient and I think best way to approach it. So, I mean, hopefully the Skylon will continue to develop and especially that engine, which I think is really special and really interesting. Um, uh, Lillian Brennan wants to know what the BFR stands for. Pamela? Big effing rocket. Big fabulous rocket? Make that F whatever you think. Whatever like. you think F should be, that's what it stands for. Perhaps use the word that Pamela used at the beginning of this broadcast. It's true. It's true. Poison Toad predicts that Elon will modify the Hyperloop into a primary launch system. <laughs> That's horrifying. Yeah, so the so there's been a few ideas about this, and we've we've covered this every now and then about these ideas of launch loops and um, and launch having some kind of electromagnetic launch system. The problem is that to get you to orbit you would have to all you know you have to experience a tremendous amount of g-forces to be able to go to orbit and so the longer the launch ramp the the better to minimize and so the launch ramp has to be something on the order of like a hundred kilometers for it to be to not squish you but cargo can have a much shorter one and then the other problem is is that you can never get to orbit from a single thrust so, in That's other words, true. right? So, Superman. Well, could they never... can get they can get super small things. Uh, so, so there's been work done to develop rail guns that are capable of of accelerating things right. that are small to launch speeds, but not humans. Humans would like die right. in a way that the Iron Man shouldn't. Somehow right. does. But it. you can never. You will if you launch a no matter what it is. If you only have the one kick from planet Earth, 
it's going to come back down. You could kick it and it's going to go all the way up oh, halfway yeah, across true. the universe. That's true. And then the Earth is going to pull it back and then it's going to, unless you kick it into a sun, you know, into a solar orbit. But you need a second boost when you hit Apogee to then go in to circularize your orbit and then to be able to do it. So you're still going to need And that boost can be rocket. external. The boost can be yes. external to you. Yeah. 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 You can have a laser up there that catches you as you, as you are sort of lofted into orbit the laser zaps you and kicks you into a more circular orbit and then you're and then you're okay um but i can totally see again that's the next level of the future is yeah have no fuel just accelerate your your payloads using electromagnetism and then off into space so that that will knock the price of and i'm sure musk is I, I wouldn't be surprised if that's what the Hyperloop is, as a way to explore that technology, because Musk is still 27 steps ahead of us all. <laughs> Joseph Meyer says that humans turn to mist. Yeah, yeah. You, yeah. Uh, well, I, on Twitter, uh, Chris Hadfield reviewed various spacecraft, fictional spacecraft, and noted that you would experience something like... Uh, 30,000 G's flying a TIE fighter. Oh, God. <laughs> right? So, yeah. Yeah, and he said he didn't want, he didn't want any part of that. The, 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 the fictional spacecraft that he wanted to fly was the one in 2001. The little ball okay. with the little arms. He yeah. said, sphere, smart. Because you... you you can't have a square, a square spacecraft can't hold an atmosphere forever. It's going to leak. Right. But a sphere can. And so he loved the idea of a spherical spacecraft. So there you go. Um, Jonas Sofri wants to know what a person explode or implode in space. They'll freeze to death. Yeah. Neither. Um, so so it turns out that like all your blood vessels will rupture especially like in your eyeballs first um and so you'll end up looking super bruised uh it it does really bad things to various parts of you but you're gonna freeze ultimately so it's unclear how you die first whether it be uh from lack of oxygen or or anything That's else you'll, you'll asphyxiate uh, right but since space is a vacuum temperature isn't conducted real fast unless you're like touching your spacecraft in which case you could get like fried on a hot surface frozen on a cold surface but space itself is just going to be like, you're cold. I'm going to rupture all your blood vessels yeah. and you have no oxygen. Yeah. Well, and the problem is you can't hold your breath in space because of oh, the pressure yeah. differential. So the first thing you do is you breathe out all your oxygen. Yeah. You, you, you empty your lungs either safely or explosively with a lot of blood because you weren't able to get the air out. So in other words, if you have to jump out into space, the first thing you do exhale. is exhale as much as you can you, yeah. because any gas that remains is going to come explosively out of your face. Then now you have no oxygen in your bloodstream, and so you got about 30 seconds of consciousness before you pass out. And then you die. Because you don't yeah. have any oxygen in your bloodstream, and there's no blood and no oxygen in your lungs, and and you get the bends as well. You're just probably dead before you get the bends. Yeah, you're gonna get the bends, but that's like literally the last thing of, you're concerned about, right? Like, oh, my joints hurt as you pass out and die. So there you go. And then yeah, you'll freeze, and your blood your your blood vessels will get all gross. Who did that recently? Well, I uh, I. Uh... Was it Star Trek a... did it? Yes. 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 So the the new Star Trek episode Discovery. of Discovery, the mirror universe, the first episode of the second sort of part of the season, they spaced a bunch of people and they yeah. handled it really well. Yeah. That, that watch that, and that's what will yeah. happen to you. The Princess Leia flying through space still has me pissed off. Didn't handle it well. What? So, so the latest Star, Star Wars, oh, Wars movie. Whoa, 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 whoa! Spoiler alert! I haven't seen it. Okay. And other okay. Too. Okay. 
Yeah, BSG did it extraordinarily well, thanks to Kevin Grazier, their science advisor. Yeah, and the folks at Star Trek handled it really well too. There's a couple of things that they didn't handle well, but they it was almost perfect. I thought it was good. But they had a tardigrade, so I can forgive yeah. so much because they had a giant tardigrade. A big, a, a big tardigrade, big adorable tardigrade. Yeah. Let's see anything else. Get picked up. Carolyn B says, get picked up by the Heart of Gold in the uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Yes. David Joseph Wesley had a question for us. He wanted to know, is there any theory supporting artificial gravity that would protect us from crazy pants acceleration? Nope. Nope. Next. No. Man, like, like we just got to, I feel like we have to ruin sci-fi Christmas here. No. It's what we do. Yeah. It's what we do. There is no thing that is going to help us have artificial gravity except for rotation and that has all kinds of problems on its own too yeah and we we haven't even figured out if if gravitons are real we don't have a method for detecting the force carrying boson at all we don't even know if there is a particle explanation for gravity without a particle explanation for gravity you can't force the particles to interact yeah, yeah. Uh, stuff and things david joseph says, would wishful thinking help yeah yes yeah, always absolutely. yeah i mean the thing is is that we always say right like like it's the according to the laws of physics as we understand them the second we understand new laws of physics. We get to throw out the old laws of physics and, in, and introduce the new ones. And the new Not ones. Not throw them out, amend them. We amend sure. the old rules. Yeah. So when the anti gravity particle is discovered, anti mass, and there's a way to concentrate it without it turn, getting turning into an anti black hole, and you could somehow control the amount of gravity. Then, then it's on, man. Then, then you've got the inertial dampeners, and you can crank them up to eleven. Um, but until then, we're stuck at ten. We're just stuck at ten. Yeah, man. You, you know what's been the funniest thing? I gotta mm -hmm. say was when we started Astronomy Cast like ten years ago, eleven years 11 ago, eleven years ago. I was the wide-eyed optimist. Right, I was the like, well, couldn't we do this and couldn't we do that and why don't we do this? And you have hardened my heart over all of these years, and now I simply <coughs> spread my bitterness. <laughs> now I am on in the YouTube space community. I am the the grumpy skeptic with a lack of 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 sort of imagination and it's so funny i did an episode you've got the imagination you just understand the reality i just understand the reality and it is the inevitable pathway that we all we all must take i think where and so everyone in the comments is always like well why can't we do this and why can't we do that and i'm just like science, science. <laughs> <laughs> and my, I, I did this episode about what you know. Will we ever be able to fly to another star? And the just the answer was like, no, no, probably not. <laughs> Sorry, like I know it sucks. I know. I, I, I do love Mer Lafferty's idea of three D printing bodies and just like uploading into new bodies mm -hmm. as needed to get there. Yeah. A couple of people are mentioning the Orville. I want to give a huge props to the Orville. Orville is awesome. I, I, from now, now what Orville is, is you going back and watching more episodes of Star Trek, the next generation, but it's funny. So some of the biggest belly laughs that I've had in modern media, I gotta say came from the Orville. Now there's a bunch of stuff that I just can't stand, but I am willing to just utterly overlook it. I just don't even care. Right. Just stuff where where they're like, why is everybody talking English? Right. And is, is it like Westworld where it's improved if you binge watch it instead of watching it spaced out? I don't I don't think so, because it is very much a 
Like, it's designed to have that Star Trek one episode, everything is resolved and wrapped up and nothing ever changes. Okay. Right? So like, it's designed to be very episodic, which is which in this is fine. And so they're like, oh, we just got to this new world that is strangely like Earth in the past. You know, like, what were the chances? You know, and then they deal with it. So... So I think that that the way they approach it, a lot of that stuff is they're, they're trying to be like Black Mirror and they're just saying like let's think of a weird situation that would be fun and interesting to explore and not spend too much time thinking about whether or not it's realistic. Is this realistic? Who cares? Let's tell a but fun story. But it's funny but which it's Black fun. Mirror isn't. It's fun and it's funny. Yeah. Nancy, your Nancy says she can't bring herself to watch the Orville, not your type of humor. Keep going. The first few episodes are rough, and then they just get better and better and better. And I would say by the end of the episodes, I would say it is absolutely punching above its weight. And I can't believe I'm saying these words because I was super against it. So it is fun. Uh, take another crack at it, Nancy. Let me know how it turns out for you. All right, let's move on to the next thing. Scott C says that I don't say whoa as much as I used to. I guess that's it. I guess that's I'm I no longer have this mind blown perspective now that I've reached my jaded self. <gasps> oh, Phoenix says, remember encounter at Farpoint, give the Orville a chance. Mm, <laughs> that zing. was such a bad episode. <laughs> oh, snap. Yeah. I. I, I Man, so I took the kids, and I'm like, all right, time to watch Star Trek. And they're like, oh, we have to. And so so we watched Encounter at Farpoint. And like, Dad, this show sucks. I'm like, I know. <laughs> Gets better. I don't. We don't care. And so that was it. That was the beginning and the end of them watching Star Trek. But they love Futurama. They hate Star Wars. They, they don't care one iota about Star Wars. Wait, did you start at episode one or did you start start at episode four? Four, of course. That we were doing Okay, yeah. just making no, sure. No. Just, just like, making sure. It's like, meh, you know, we've seen this. You know, we've seen a bunch of this kind of thing before. Yeah. So, but, and they're, but they are big sci-fi nerds, right? So they, but they, this is the thing. This is where we're at. You know, they love Rick and Morty. They love Black Mirror. So they just, they don't like Star Wars and they don't like Star Trek. Um, let's see. Age of Atheism wants to know, would a space elevator work on Mars or the moon? Oh, yeah, totally. Better. Yeah. Yeah, no problem. Less atmosphere. Yeah. Yeah, not one problem at all. The It's not even less atmosphere. The lower gravity means that you can use like fabrics like spectra you can use kinds of advanced composite fabrics that we have here now and they would work it's like a, a space elevator on earth is the one that we don't know if if this it, if it will ever be possible to create yeah. the kinds of nanofibers and i know the folks at the space elevator institute say that they can but but no one's We're been able to not make nanotubes. so sure yeah people have not been able to make nanotubes longer than still a few centimeters so uh, Red Dwarf, yeah, they're dead, Dave. Everybody's dead, Dave. They they enjoyed uh, Red Dwarf. So, C Carla, right? My wife won't watch Star Trek beyond uh, the old show. She won't watch Next Generation, won't watch Voyager, won't watch Deep Space Nine, anything. Has to be only old show. And now that Leonard Nimoy is dead, she won't even watch that i wanted to watch this spock documentary she just can't bring herself to watch it she just loved him so much all right i think it's time to wrap this up we hopefully have made this up for you oh yeah the expanse watch that yet yes okay right. i like the books better still but all it's right. good but i still like the books better right on all right let's wrap this up Thanks, everybody. Uh, big thanks, as always, to the good folks from the WSH crew. They are the people who supply the chat. They are the community. They are the producers of the Weekly Space Hangout. Uh, you have, If you are a big space fan, you want to join this group. So go to wshcrew.space and 
participate in this awesome community. So, and thanks. And a always. shout out to our Patreons who let this show happen. We will have Patreon office hours starting as soon as I'm done boiling more water for hot tea because I am powered by hot tea today. Thanks, patrons. Thanks, WSH crew. Thanks, Pamela. Thanks, viewers. Thanks, underlying laws of physics. We'll see you all next week.